When you're in the field and you're taking possession of wildlife, you are now obliged to do so under authorization. And so collecting these will require collection permits. You might have to go to the federal government for one, you might have to go to the provincial government for one. And again, you need to know which wildlife falls under which sections. In the province of Ontario, a fisheries or a wildlife. Mussels are under the Fisheries Act. Crayfish are under the Fisheries Act. And those are listed in the Ontario fishing regulations. Birds. There's waterfowl birds, such as the ducks, and the waterfowls of swans. They're protected by the Federal Migratory Birds Convention Act. Along with the waterfowl, you'll quite commonly find, and this is birds as well, but with waterfowl and birds, um, check for bands. And you may find various bands um, on the different species. This is a neck collar band you'll find on swans or perhaps geese. These are the leg bands that you'll also find on geese and on ducks. They were developed so that people could see from a distance a coded message on the band. And when you go to report these, you need to report color and color of code. So this is a blue band with white colored code. And that tells the uh, <clears throat> banding office the location of where the bird was banned. And at that time, the age of the bird was taken so that, you know, five years later, uh, you now have an age and a nesting site territory if it was uh, banned as a hatching year young. But those are important to report also to the federal government or to the authoritative agency. People are working around the house, so quite commonly come across uh, bird nests. And if the bird is a migratory animal, the bird and its nest is protected under the Migratory Birds Convention Act. So you're just not allowed legally to go and dispose of a, of a bird nest. But you have to wait for the bird to leave the nest, and that means hatch the eggs, and then raise the young so that the young displaced from the nest, disperse from the nest, and the nest becomes abandoned. But up to that time, that nest and those birds are protected by the endanger, uh, under the Federal Migratory Birds Convention Act. If you're looking at insects, be it butterflies, moths, bees, they're all protected under the various acts of Canada and, and the Ontario government. The moth is protected by the Ontario government, but if you're dealing with monarch butterflies, they're protected by the federal government. Bees are protected by the province, but bees are also private ownership and owned by the people that possess them. So you need to recognize both. So you're out in the field, you've got your gear, you know what you're looking for, and some of the first things you come across are animal tracks. And these are examples, dog tracks, canid, canid tracks. These are exemplified by coyotes, fox, domestic dogs. I bring this to your attention because quite often you have to identify these. It's very beneficial if you're out in the field to have your book on animal tracks. A lot of the wildlife's prints are smaller than domestic dogs. I've had experiences where we're out doing coyote track tracking and all of a sudden you've got a four inch, four and a half inch track and the employer wishes to know what is that? Well it's the difference between a coyote which is a wildlife native to southern Ontario and a Great Dane for example. Uh, dogs that are in our area uh, but they're much larger than the prints of domestic animals or wildlife animals. This is called a planter and it's, it's two lobed. It's the other thing about canid tracks is that they always have 
toenail prints. So when you're in the field and you come across a two and a half inch print with toenail prints, you're dealing with a dog or a canid. Also in the field you come across felines. Cats have the ability to withdraw their toenails. So quite commonly you'll see the prints of the toe but you don't have the toenail print. So again the characteristics of cat are it's three lobed at the planter whereas a dog print is two lobed. So you'll see these uh, in the field, commonly in agricultural settings in Southern Ontario, they're barn cats. But we do have bobcats. If you're walking along a stream, along a uh, bush lot, you'll come across this print, which is a raccoon print. Very characteristic is the long finger-like presence of that print. And those are also seen from raccoons. Another common print in the field are cervids. And cervids are deer, and they are very characteristics of uh, hooved animals. And what that is, is it's an animal that's evolved over time that has grown its toenail into a hoof. The males are much heavier than the does, and you'll often see a, sec a third and fourth print behind the hoof, so that'll give you sex. The male being heavier will have a deeper print on the track as well. When you're out in the field, you'll also come across scat. Scat being feces, and each scat will have a characteristic trait to it, which will help you identify several things. First off, the scat itself will show the type of species. For example, this is a much larger, which is a moose scat. It's circular, dries out round, it's herbaceous. This is opposed to a coyote uh, scats, which are much larger than most scat, have fur in them, have bones in them, and you can see the presence of food items. So the scat will just give you the species producing the scat, but it'll also give you an indication of what it's feeding on. And for biologists working in the field, knowing that you've got coyote feeding on deer, skunk, or domestic cat, it's important to know the diet of the animal you're studying. You can also find fox scat. It's smaller than the uh, coyote, and it hasn't got the seeds in it. Uh, see the scat would be a raccoon. This has got bunny rabbit fur in it, and the smaller scat tell you it's a fox.